Okay, we are just after 10 a.m. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. This will be recorded. So if anybody uh, comes in late, then they can uh, catch up online. Um, so this is part two of a two series uh, workshop that we're hosting on writing the Ronald E. McNair Post-Baccalaureate Scholarship Program proposal. So for those who are interested in applying for McNair at their institutions. Um, and so I am excited uh, for this session uh, and especially to introduce you you uh, to my colleagues as well as myself. So I'm Cami Valdez. I am an assistant professor of chemistry at Northeastern State University and my connection uh, to the LSMRCE conference is that I am Oklahoma LSAMP alumni. Um, and my connection to McNair is that I was a director at Wellesley College uh, for a few years and I also served as our president of the McNair Association of Professionals and now I'm the past president, uh, which brings us to our panelists. And so I'll let each of you introduce yourselves. Uh, these are alphabetical by last name. So John, you, you are up. Cool. My name is John Kreider. I'm the director of the McNair program at Texas Tech University. I'm also the current president um, of McNair Association of Professionals and one of the founding founding members um, and organizers. So um, that's been an exciting, which maybe at some point we'll talk about that for those that might be interested in. Um, I've been involved with McNair um, going on six years this round, but then I also served as a McNair um, graduate assistant when I was in the master's program. I myself was not a McNair scholar, um, but I've been, been, been in heavily involved over pretty much my whole profession. Well, a good portion of my professional career. So um, excited to be here. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. My name is Christabel Dragu, and I am uh, the director of the McNair Scholars Program at the University of Oregon. I'm also um, a McNair alum from the University of Oregon's program, and I've been involved with our program, although I just hit my one year mark as the director. I've been involved with our program really since I graduated with my bachelor's. I stayed um, in Eugene, Oregon for my, my master's and my PhD, which I'll actually finish this term. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, right in time for a 10 year deadline um, for those of you, which I'm sure Cami will get to later. Um, we, um, but I have been lucky to be involved with the program really closely and serve on all the different sort of committees that are involved when we recruit alumni and um, have students sit on our admissions committees and our interview committees and, and different panels and things like that. Um, hello, everybody. Um, Michael Hunt here. And um, it, Christabel, let me tell you, wait, this is so funny. I didn't, some of the stuff you just said, I had no, one, I didn't know you was an alum, um, but then I didn't know you were alum from the, the same institution because that's similar to me. And so like, so there's like when you were talking and finishing a PhD, same thing here. So it's like all, all um, so, so many um, similarities. So yeah, that's why we got this good energy this, today. Um, my, uh, Michael Hunt, I'm the director of the McNair Scholars Program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I'm also the parliamentarian for Matt, um, the McNair Association of Professionals. Um, I am an alum of UMBC and an alum of the McNair Program at UMBC. It's been longer than 10 years, um, but I'm still <laughs> working on my doctorate. Um, and sort of uh, my goal, hopefully, in, in all things, by at least by 2024 is, is my goal. It was 2025, but things started moving. And so that's one, i just be honest, one of the blessings from the pandemic is that I've been able to get more schoolwork done and focus in some degrees. Um, but um, yeah, exci very excited. I've been um, the director. Uh, I came at, back to UMBC in 2017 as the interim assistant director and then became the director in 2019 as well. So I'm glad to be with you all. Thank you all so much for those introductions and hopefully you all can see uh, joining us uh, on, on this call, uh, what an amazing all-star panel uh, that we have here today. So I'm grateful for all of you for joining um, at your various time uh, time zones. So I know it's really early uh, for Christabel joining us here um, and getting a little late probably for Michael. So anywho, um, really glad to have you all and to share about your experiences uh, with McNair uh, with this group of folks today. So just a little bit on the agenda. So 
We're going to start out by talking a little bit about just the McNair Scholars Program. I'll give a high level overview of, of what that looks like, um, but then we're going to drill down and really look at three different program uh, models. So uh, John, uh, Christabel and Michael each uh, give examples of their program and what that looks like um, over a um, actually all three of them have pre programs so over kind of a three year window for the program, but typically McNair is two years and we'll talk about that. And then the second part of this will really be just a panel discussion, talking a little bit about the McNair Scholars Program overall, um, uh, drilling down a little bit on the proposal process and timeline, um, because if you're planning to apply for McNair, um, you probably have lots of questions around that. And then uh, talking a little bit about getting started with that proposal and uh, sharing in this expertise and wealth of knowledge that we have from all of our panelists. So um, that's what it's going to look like today. Um, uh, so we'll start here with kind of finding that right model for you. And so um, thinking about what is the McNair Scholars Program, um, you know, if you're joining the session, many of you probably do not have a McNair Scholars Program, and so this is new to you, so I just want to give a high-level view of this. Um, so McNair Scholars Programs are federally funded uh, research program, uh, so they're funded by the Department of Education. Um, they support students from a diverse background, um, and so those are first-gen and low-income students as well as students of color. Um, the goal of the program is really to help students uh, prepare for uh, applying to graduate school um, and help them with that application process and getting into graduate schools and the idea of being that we can uh, diversify the um, PhD as well as the prof professoriate in the process and then of course um, through the work of the two years of being in this uh, program so typically students are in the program junior and senior year it helps to prepare them for graduate school by providing them with research um, experience as well as a number of different workshops and um, seminars and uh, research courses as you'll hear about. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways in which um, programs uh, prepare these students for graduate school so that they have that professional development as well as that research experience so that they're ready to take on the PhD um, in many different fields. And so I do wanna say here that, um, you know, LSAMP, of course, is focused specifically on STEM, and this imagery might suggest that this is a STEM program. Um, I am a scientist by training, and so I think these pictures are cute. Um, but uh, in any field can be represented in McNair, and so um, there are times where that um, in this last cycle, uh, McNair had a competitive priority preference for STEM. Um, it did not mean that your whole program had to be STEM. It meant that, you know, if you wanted to get those points, you had to add a, um, a, a, a certain um, amount of STEM. STEM students that uh, might be part of your program, so a slight STEM focus, but not that your program has to be entirely. So it could be any discipline, arts and humanities, um, education, um, and then of course, uh, social sciences as well as STEM. So. Uh, just to, to make sure that that's clear. Um, I did wanna make sure to point out uh, the eligibility for our students in this program, um, because that is one of the most confusing pieces of the McNair Scholars Program. So um, students who can be part of your cohort. So two thirds of them must be um, first generation. So first in their family to earn a bachelor's degree and low income, and that's defined by um, uh, the um, federal poverty. Um, what percentage, sorry, that's escaping my mind right now. <laughs> it's early in the morning. What's the percentage of the, the federal, uh, the poverty line? Below 150%. 150%. Yep, there it came to me <laughs> as you said it. So yeah, 150%. And then uh, one third of your program may be uh, from historically underrepresented races and ethnicities. So that's um, students that are Black or African American, Hispanic or Latinx, um, Native American, Indigenous, uh, Pacific Islander. Um, and those are um, defined in our regulations. And so the only way to make an exception for that is one on one basis um, for students. So when you're thinking about your program broadly, um, it's going to be those categories. Of course, you don't have to um, have this one third, your whole program could be first gen and low income. Um, and often we see intersections of many of those identities in our scholars, but I just want to point out the eligibility there of what those diverse students are that can be in the program. 
And so now we'll talk um, about these uh, example programs. And so John, you're going to kick us off. And so um, we'll uh, I'll let you talk a little bit about your program, but I'll just set it up real quick that uh, this is our first uh, three models. And so uh, in the Texas Tech program, they have a pre-program um, explorers, I believe. Um, and then uh, during the academic year, they're doing a research course that is not for credit. And then in the summer, uh, the students are participating and research through an internship um, at Texas Tech. And so with that, I will let you take it away. These are animated, so I will click through um, <laughs> to help you uh, go through it, so. Yeah, so um, I think to make it clear is their sophomore year is that we recruit our McNair Explorers. They can be first years or sophomores. Majority are sophomores. And um, they are not officially admitted to the McNair Scholars Program. So to use McNair lingo, I don't report them on our APR. They're like not official students. This is truly an explore program. It's part of my recruitment plan in the plan of operation to, again, use some of that language for grants. But um, we recruit in the fall and actually it's so the main recruitment's in the fall, but we do do some during the summer as we do like orientations and things of that sort. But um, we bring them in and really what the program is all about is introduction to what graduate school is, introduction to what research is. We also introduce them to all the research opportunities on campus. Um, and that gives them many choices because some of the students, McNair may not be the best fit. Also, like this year we recruited 25 explorers. I have um, a, two cohorts of 13, so obviously all 25 are not going to be able to go into my cohort of 13. So we have a place for them to, to land and be able to continue doing the amazing work that they want to do. Also, it's a way for students to realize maybe grad school isn't for me or maybe research isn't for me. And then this gives them really a, an easy way to bow out with really no embarrassment because it is an explorer program. And then in the spring, we encourage them to obviously apply to the scholars program for those that want to. And then they can also apply to the other programs on campus. Um, all of them have, except for one, all of them have a spring um, application date. And so there is one that's in the fall, but we talked to them about that beforehand. Um, then we interview them for the McNair Scholars Program. We select those that stay in the Explorers throughout the spring. Um, we continue to do different types of seminars. It's not heavy, our, our explorers program, we meet once a month as a group and then they have one-on-ones. So we have contact with them basically twice a month um, at the minimum. We invite them to a lot of our larger programs that the scholars offer, but, um, and if they, they basically meet the program, um, eligible, or meet the program uh, requirements, they're given preference for the scholars program. It's not a guarantee, but they're given preference. And then there is no summer, aspect of that. And so for our scholar program, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, for, our, for our scholars program, we do recruit them in the spring of their sophomore year, um, or we occasionally will bring in um, a, to recruit the spring of their first year, if they're just an amazing scholar or explorer, or they just really just impress us, like they're already jumping into to, to the research and they're just kind of on, on that, but we usually, most of the majority of our 13 are, are rising juniors when we recruit them. And they start in the fall, we have our um, orientation, then our research methods course, and that research methods course is taught by a full-time professor on campus. Um, it is non-credit bearing at the moment. Um, as some of you know, it takes a while to get a credit, credit bearing. And then because we deal with the majority of low-income students, trying to figure out a way for them to not have to pay for that credit. Um, it's just a process. So that's something we're working on. But um, with they in there, the deliverable is their literature review, as well as we require them to meet with our, or our, our life coaches on campus. We have, we have academic coaches, but we also have actual life coaches. And so we have them work with them that talks about planning and organization and figuring out, you know, um, what their goals are and 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 whatnot, which moves us into the spring. So by the end of the fall semester, they have um, ideally selected a mentor, um, and they started working with that mentor. And so the spring, the the research proposals do that they have to work with the mentor to complete 
because we want to be um, discipline specific. Um, we also start working on personal statements. We have the Career Center come in and we're talking about resumes and we introduce what the graduate school application is. Um, they finalize the proposal and then we do what we call the McNair Research Symposium Spring Edition, um, where they um, will present, all of the scholars will present their proposal. So it's usually a five to seven minute presentation um, to the public. We we normally did it in person, but since COVID, we've now done it virtual. And this last year, where we did it hybrid, and it was it was really well attended, and I'm kind of excited to be able to continue that. Um, we do do a five week um, GRE prep class during the spring, and currently that's taught by me because in a previous life I actually worked for Kaplan, so um, I've got I kind of got the inside track, and so. Um, we we use we do that, um, but we have actually hired like a math professor to come in and teach the basic, you know, because the GRE test basically up to high school algebra two. So some of our scholars have it's been a while since they they've done that that type of math, and then that moves us into the summer. So we do do a summer research internship, um, or we a lot of us call it the SRI. Um, I know some people use different. Acronym, different names for the SRR and I, and you'll see that in, in Michael's and, and, and Christabel's, but um, it's eight weeks, it's June and July. And so that's when they get paid their stipend that McNair is allowed to pay our scholars. And then we do a personal statement boot camp. It's over three weeks where they basically, at the end of it, if they do everything that we've asked them to do, they will have a pretty complete um, personal statement draft. Um, it's not completely done because they still have to do research on their grad schools and add that you know, paragraph that customizes it. But we talk about funding for graduate school. Um, we usually bring in the uh, our graduate school fellowship representatives. So we introduce um, like the NSF, GRP, the Ford Fellowship, those national ones, as well as internal ones, and then how to look for internal fellowships at schools they might graduate in. We do have uh, the graduate school worksheet that we have them do where they have to research at a minimum, we require them to apply to six schools, but we, I tell them like the sky's the limit because McNair require, um, offers a, a free um, fee waiver for most graduate schools. And so really, once you've written your personal statement, it doesn't take a lot of effort to just add more. So most of my PhDs that are going directly to a PhD are applying to nine to 12. Um, and then we also, um, as funds are available and, and we try to push for a national conference um, and send our students. We've gone to Berkeley, Maryland, Buffalo, you know, just where, whoever happens to be offering them. Obviously COVID changed that. So we did a lot of virtual conferences um, and we're hoping to be able to continue that. And so that gets them basically through first year. And then the senior year, they, so can be the next slide. So senior year, um, <laughs> when I look at it, it seems very like simplistic, but it's actually probably the hardest year for a lot of our scholars um, because in the fall, they're applying to graduate school and doing graduate school visits. We do another McNair Research Symposium. So it's our fall edition. This is where we select um, four or five of our 13 to present their research to the public. And the reason why we do only four or five is because these are now 15 minute presentations with five minutes Q and A, so they're 20 minutes. And if we did all 13, we'd be there for four hours and our faculty would, would revolt. Um, <laughs> and I've done that one time and it was, it was, it was painful. So we, we kind of select um, our four or five and they do another um, presentation. We do try to encourage to go to professional national conferences by this point. And so we have a lot of students that that began applying to those and will go in the fall and spring as, as appropriate. Also, they're applying to grad school and we warn our scholars that applying to grad school, especially if you're going to like nine, nine to 12 schools is like taking a three credit class on top of everything else they're doing. And it's gonna take time to get their letter of recommendation, all those things. So we spent, we spent a lot of time on working with scholars. Um, something to, pay, to, to, to reiterate is during the junior and summer and then senior year, we are meeting with them in one-on-ones every other week. And then we have a seminar on the off week that we're not meeting with them. So we have weekly contact with, with all of our scholars. Sometimes it's more because scholars love to stop in and we have a lab for them where they'll come in and 
and do stuff. So we, we, we get a lot of face-to-face -face time. In the spring, um, we, we, um, we move forward <coughs> with prepping our scholars for interviews. If associated, we do a lot of mock interviews. We teach them how to compare their offers, how to negotiate those, how to make the best decision for what they actually want to do. Um, a lot of our seniors will continue their research that they did throughout the, 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 their junior and summer years. And so they're kind of completing those again. Um, a lot of our scholars do happen to be end up becoming first authors, second authors, a numbered author of some type um, in their prospective lab. So while we don't require publication, we heavily in, encourage it. Um, and then um, we also bring in a sociologist who comes in and talks about um, cultural capital and the transition to grad school with all of the multiple identities that our scholars are coming in and how to juggle that, have a transition. We also do a class on how to, it's, it's usually in the fall, but sometimes in the spring, on how to speak to your parents who may not have ever gotten a bachelor's degree about why it's important to get a PhD and what that means. And so we, I call, you know, um, one of my uh, former uh, assistant directors called it our academic ease class is teach them how to speak academic language, but then also to bring it down um, to, to, so those that aren't familiar with grad school can understand um, and kind of feel a little bit more comfortable in sending their students into a potential another five to 10 years of, of school. So that's basically it. Occasionally we do get a third year um, of our scholars, like if we recruit a first year and then they end up having a super senior or something. And we are developing a peer mentorship for those extra seniors to basically kind of help with our explorers or younger. And as a side note, our explorer that you see in the bottom left-hand corner, that was designed by one of my graphic design McNair scholars um, a few years back. And so I'm, you know, I always want to give her, you know, give Becky credit due for, for the work that she did for us. But basically, it, mine is a two-year program with a one-year explorers program that are not officially brought into the program. Um, there are some three-year, official three-year programs, but I use that, that explorers as, as a recruitment tool. So there's my program. Thanks, John. All right. So next we're going to have uh, uh, Christabel sharing about her program at University of Oregon. And so um, interestingly, uh, all three of these models have these pre-programs. Um, and so for Christabel's uh, program, they're called their Launchpad um, is their, their uh, pre-program. And then during the academic year, they have workshops. They are not affiliated with a specific course. So that's a difference, one of the main differences here. And then also in the summer, uh, she has what uh, I'm calling a research institute. So um, where that there's specific programming, it's um, the, the stipend is tied to that. And then the students are also doing research. So a lot of programming happening over the summer as well. And so I will let you uh, take over and share about your awesome program. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Oh, I guess I should say, I shouldn't assume it's the morning for everyone. It's 824 over here on the West Coast. Um, so good morning. Um, the sun is just starting to peak and um, believe it or not, it's actually pretty dark outside right now. Definitely feels like fall. I don't know about where you all are coming from, but um, it's very nice to be here. And I wanted to just say thanks again to Cami um, and the rest of the panel before I dive right in. Our sophomore year, yes, it's called the Launchpad. It's brand new this year, actually. It turned out to be sort of something uh, designed by accident. Uh, we had a few students, we had six students who applied for the McNair Scholars Program, who are, uh, which as as Cami said, ours is very similar to John's. Um, it's a it's a two year program designed for junior and senior, which I'll get into in a second. Um, but but we had a, a six sophomores apply, and as my first year as director, I just thought, oh my gosh, maybe this was bad advertising. Maybe I didn't do a good enough job. Whatever. I thought I can't just turn these students away. They're amazing. They totally fit the eligibility criteria, which Cami covered earlier. And so I said, you know what, we're going to keep them. And actually, this is perfect because there's a couple gaps that I've found over the years working with the program and even ones I've experienced as a scholar myself um, in terms of being prepared for the McNair Scholars Program. It's a really fast, rigorous two years on top of a really already busy 
two years for high achieving students, right? Um, so I thought this is great. Let's let's get some more time with them to help them uh, and prepare them for onboarding onto the McNair program. So this year is actually interesting. We had um, again six students. We will have six that are actually guaranteed admission into the McNair Scholars Program, but. After this cohort, it's not guaranteed. I'm hoping to have more students um, this coming year. The applications are open currently right now. So we, as the first, um, the the first section here says we are recruiting right now actively um, around campus, and our students are actively recruiting their their friends and colleagues. Then we're going to start with both the McNair Scholars and the Launchpad. They'll both start in winter. So as you can see here, we're also a quarter system school. So everything is, is kind of built onto, or some people call it trimesters. Um, but we are uh, going to be entering into our first um, real true sort of pre-program this coming year. Last year was sort of just hodgepodge putting it together on on the fly this year there's a little more organization behind it um yes we're going to cover what is research right they a lot of them come into um even though we're an r1 institution so many of our students know that they can get involved with research but they don't actually know what it means or what is it and what is what what really is it or isn't it um and and how do i connect to get involved with it so that's what we cover in winter in spring um they will continue on attending the kind of we have the big mcnair family as as stolen from michael hunt um we like to call our students like the big mcnair family so we have the seniors and the juniors and now we have the sophomores too um, and we continue having these workshops sprinkled in throughout the year. Um, we then sort of switch to focusing on, all right, is research, now that you kind of understand what research is, now what's grad school and why would you need to go to grad school, like to do what you want to do in the long run, right? Again, <clears throat> working on seeking mentors so we really start figuring out how to communicate with faculty that first term but the second term is then really um, reaching out to faculty and making those email connections which are really really hard for our students um, i can't emphasize that enough so there's a lot of coaching that goes in whether it's one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of email exchange practicing with, with me or or someone else um, and then we do talk about what research is out there once you connect with faculty are there opportunities and also extramural sort of um, summer reus across the country um, and that's something that they will work on in spring summer then we um, very similar again to, to john we don't really do any programming in summer we just hope that they're and plan and and get them involved and connected to something that they'll be able to be engaged with in summer. Um, and for those that aren't, they continue to seek uh, connecting with faculty. Um, and there are no uh, resources from the grant tied to this at this moment. Um, I definitely would like to explore building this into our next grant um, when that comes up. But uh, right now it's sort of our pilot and it's going great. Um, yeah, next. Perfect. So then we go into the junior year. This is really what we consider our traditional like uh, historic like McNair program beginning. So junior year, uh, we are right now again in recruitment. So they're applying our our applications close in about a week. So on Halloween, um, and then we start to interview and we hope to have all those decisions made by Thanksgiving, um, definitely by winter break for us, which is like December 10th. Um, and then we also have a, oh, and something I want to add here, I think that's important for those of you to know who are going to decide to do a, um, a McNair uh, application for the grant. One of the things that we found really successful in ours is having multiple um, different kind of stakeholders outside of our division. We're in the division of under, undergraduate education student success, which is like advising and, um, and, and other entities such as that. We have very deliberate, um, deliberately built into the grant that we have faculty and we have we have alumni from the program and we have so there's all these different positions on the interview committee that i think is really important to think about when you're writing your grant um and we will make sure to also continue putting into our next grant too i think it's a really having the buy-in from people outside of your division especially faculty i um i'm finding to be really beneficial for us 
Um, okay, then January 1st, um, again, following our, our kind of weird, bizarre quarter schedule that we have, uh, we have a start right uh, first week in January where we are welcoming them in with the orientation. Um, we have the seniors actually presenting to the juniors in sort of an informal way, their research. Um, this year, I think we're going to do a poster session so that they can walk around and talk. And then it's just another opportunity um, to have the seniors seniors uh, talking and, and practicing what it means to disseminate their science. Uh, we also really work hard on breaking down myths and barriers. Research um, ethics is a big one, starting everyone out, even if they're not a human subjects researcher, but really just thinking through like, what does it mean to be a scientist? Um, and then also introducing cool topics into, into the different workshops that we're sprinkling in now. Um, we have a new one on open data science or open science. Data science is another one. Um, and some other, other cool things. So really giving them the sort of most uh, holistic, but also cutting edge information that they're gonna need at going into being a scholar in grad school. Uh, spring, we then start working on if they haven't already identified a mentor that, they, that is committed to being their McNair Scholars uh, summer, you know, internship mentor, um, then we're really making sure that we get that figured out by spring by spring. And then also they, the mentor has to sign off on their proposal by May 15th. Um, and so the other parts of that that we're working on are what are the different aspects of a proposal? What are the, what are supposed to be in those sections? What does it mean? What's the difference between a proposal and, and like your finished product, right? And, and the language that goes into that, right? Proposals like what you're going to do. Um, and that's hard. That's a hard switch when you're first learning how to do that. Um, and the other thing is, yes, cultural activity. We've all, we're struggling with that at the moment. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from the rest of the panel on some ideas here. And I know I've talked to Cammie about this before. Historically, our program has always done this Bach Festival, which is here in Eugene, which is a big deal. Um, and I, it does, and now that with COVID, everything sort of has shaken out. I'll, I'm a new director. I don't have that cultural capital to actually get involved with that and and the way that the previous director did so i'm actually hunting for some new cultural activities um but that's something too that a lot of folks um have questions about and maybe we'll have time i don't know cammy if to talk about that later um when you build that into the to the grant yeah and i'll just pause here to say that cultural activities is one of the things that you may do on the grant but it's not a must um as far as the services that you must that you must provide to the scholars so cultural activities are something you can do i don't have to do um but many many programs like to include them um you know both for building social capital and bonding and things amongst the cohort but also just to expose our scholars to different um things that they may not otherwise get to experience so um all right sorry <laughs> so I I really no, I'm, actually, sure to I'm so happy you said that too, because yes, it is definitely some of the things um, that's another thing when you read the grant is there are things just like Cammie said, you have to do and then some things that you can do. And I'm really happy. I'm actually really relieved um, with as a new as a new person with this program um, and the PI for the program have not having to report on our APR cultural activity because we just didn't there was nothing that we could really do during COVID that I could at least think of, <laughs> um, you know. So, okay, thank you. And then, yeah, summer, we, we just like John, uh, we get right into the Summer uh, Research Institute. We continue to meet for our weekly seminar and our workshops. And we are also doing a one week long this year. I was lucky enough to recruit uh, Dr. Valdez to have a one week long uh, grad school boot camp which was really amazing. Um, I still refer back to the recordings of that for our students who are looking um, through and, and applying to grad school right now. Um, but it gets us going so that they have a, some working documents for their application, their grad school application. So their cover, or not cover letter, excuse me, their personal statement um, or statement of purpose, depending on the school they're applying to. Um, and they're really working out an eight 
eight-ish week, we really are flexible as long as they get it done in the summer term. So ours is between July and September. As long as they get it done in there, we really count the hours in our program. So at 160 hours, they get their first summer stipend at the 320 hours, they get their second stipend. Um, and altogether, again, it's $2,800 um, for, for the whole thing. Um, okay. Oh, and most importantly, our brand new part of this too is we require that they attend and present their research in a works in progress symposia at a National McNair conference. And lucky for us, we were able to connect with Michael Hunt and we are now a UMBC uh, like official school. We are doing it every year. It is amazing. And I highly suggest that you get your entire cohort to do that. That's it is a requirement from here on out as long as I'm director. And um, it's amazing. Our students had nothing but great things to say. It's it's low stakes. It's a community oriented event. Michael makes it incredible and easy for us as directors. And so um, I highly suggest uh, that when you consider writing sort of opportunities like that into your grant, put down UMBC for sure. I didn't pay her, y'all. I didn't pay her. He Just did. to let y'all know, he I didn't pay her. He did. It was uh, but that also, good. girl, wait till you come to Baltimore. See, that was virtual. <laughs> That was the virtual experience. Wait till you get the live in person <laughs> experience. Come on now. A spontaneous endorsement. Spontaneous endorsement. I was, I no, I'm I'm dead serious, y'all. It was amazing. Yeah, and it wasn't even in person. So I'm excited. There's a boat thing too, and I I keep hearing about the boat thing, and I don't know what that's about, but I'm all, I'm in. They might not get me back in Eugene. I might just stay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. I will say there there are a number of uh you know national conferences hosted by um different McNair Scholars programs. Most of them are listed on the McNair Scholars doc. Com, a website so you can check those out um so there are different regions that host them um but of course the umbc one is great so um shout out for them all right yep. i'll let you continue on for shout out for Shame. senior year yes senior year so here's where we are right now with our seniors they are now applying to grad school most of the applications are due december 1st for phd programs um, and for master's programs they're due pretty soon here so we're working on that right now we're finishing tightening up those personal statements and the other essays and things the other thing that um, i built into our summer curriculum uh, for this previous summer right here between the junior and senior year is that I had them do little sort of mini assignments throughout the term that were tied with our course. And I decided since previously I had been um, working in the Office of Distinguished Scholarships, the Knight Hennessy Scholarship at Stanford is incredible. And it also is broken down into all these different little pieces. So every week I had them do a piece, not knowing that it was actually for the Knight Hennessy. And now I have a couple of students who are that when I announced in fall, by the way, guess what you all did? Um, you just really need to tighten those up and you have a full fellowship application ready to go to Stanford. And I have a couple that are taking me up on that offer. I'm really excited. But also um, building that into your curriculum, I think is, is going to be something I just highly suggest because when it comes to applying, feeling like those fellowships are, um, they feel so scary and even more like on top of all the grad school things, right? It's just really overwhelming. So if there's a way you can sneak that in and it's like getting you know kids to eat vegetables by by, by blending it and sticking it in food it's that's how i think of it as a parent i can't help it i'm a parent so it's that's just that's just how i think about things how can i sneak that in there and get them to do it where it's not so scary but then also being like wow look what you did uh, so we're working on those things right now. And then um, academic writing is the focus right now. So really, what are the different kind of ways that that we write as scientists and, and that's different than other languages? Um, again, continuing, we have our weekly seminars and workshops. I should also say through all of this, including the launch pad, just like John, I'm meeting with these students one-on-one -on -one every month. It's also, that's built into our grant as well. Um, and also, um, yeah, seeing them every week. And then winter, we are going to be moving into most of them, if they're applying for PhDs, have done so. And winter for us is January through March. So they are now getting inter invites for interviews. Um, we're really focusing on practicing, doing mock interviews, things like that. For those who are applying to master's, they're then applying for master's degrees. Um, 
Also, another thing that's not on here that I forgot to mention was letters of recommendation. We talk about that earlier on, as you know, because by now they need to have all those in with their grad school. But that's another big part of the programming. Um, it's very scary. It's something, again, you know, you don't, as a first gen student, um, personally speaking, first gen student coming in, you know, you don't really know what that, how do you ask for one of those? What does that mean? Um, Anyway, and then we also do another um, practice uh, presentation. We do a um, we do one with a smaller group um, this time, which is really great. Um, we also then, gosh, I'm trying to think what else. Winter. The other thing that's interesting about winter is that we stop with our um, kind of course. Our course stops here for the seniors, and this is when for programming as the as the director. I switch from having a course with those that cohort to the new cohort. So winter is when that kind of shifts for me. So there's lots of different calendars you have to kind of think about. This is one of those things where on an academic calendar, it doesn't follow, but on a regular like January to December calendar, it follows. So I have all the students from the entire January through December as juniors, but then their senior year, I, I stop meeting with them as, uh, as a, a, in a course setting, um, continue meeting with them for workshops and one-on-ones, and then the new cohort starts with me. Um, okay, spring. Spring is decisions, yes. Um, how, do you, how do you navigate making decisions if you have multiple offers? Um, the other thing is really heavy on writing. This, um, I just started, which I guess um, is, is helpful to know too, is I started this thing called writing circles, um, which is, uh, every day, Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, time where we have in our McNair Scholars Lounge just a set time for writing and working on their uh, research, uh, really writing up their research because that's where they're at with it. For the most part, they've all collected their data and, and, and analyzed or are currently analyzing. Um, and, and now it's about writing. Um, so we talk a lot, too, about... Um, it's, we celebrate in spring. Spring is kind of where everything feels like it's wrapping up. Um, we have our uh, requirement of our grant is that they do the University of Oregon Undergraduate Research Symposium, um, which is for all you know campus wide. Um, and then we also have our big sort of like party and graduation. You know they've officially done the thing and they're graduating and faculty come and stakeholders from across you know the the campus come and all sorts of things. And then. And then that's it. Now, if we're lucky enough to have sorry, room, I hear what you said. oh, and Siri's on my watch talking to me. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, and so, if we're lucky enough to have room in our next cohort, then um, we will have, and we have anyone who needs to um, have uh, funding. If there's any, I have a couple students right now, about two, one or two students who will be continuing on as sort of like super seniors. Um, they are just really stellar, amazing, engaged, took advantage of all the opportunities, and they're going to be coming on for a second McNair project with us in summer. Um, yeah, but that's that's how ours works. Um, as you can see, yeah, we recruit in so sophomore year. We don't do first years. Um, we reach out to first years, but we really want them their sophomore year. And then again, no funding is going toward that, but it's recruitment and preparation. I think of it like onboarding. I'm from Los Angeles. I think of it like getting onto the freeway, going 90 miles an hour by the time they hit junior year. And so that's what I'm preparing them for. Those are the conversations we have. Um, and then and getting them with a mentor so that by junior year, they hit the ground running and the, all the things that we throw at them and and support them with are not as scary um and that's it yeah Thanks. i think i covered everything i know i took a lot yes. of time for the stop. no you're fine no this is great because i think that both the fact that you've got this summer institute so it's you know a different type of model but also the quarter system right and looking at a model that's gonna have um even more kind of semesters right that that have to be covered although you're talking about the same you know 12 months but in a, in a different slicing of the pie so thank you so much um and then um we will have next up uh, michael hunt who's at university of maryland baltimore county umbc um who's gonna share our third model once again has a pre-program 
Um, and that is for first, first or second year, uh, first years or sophomores, um, and then has uh, academic year research course. Um, and uh, this is for credit. Uh, so that differs from John's model that's not for credit for that course. And then in uh, Michael's program, what really differs is that the students in the summer, they go off and do research at other schools. Um, so they do research uh, through REU programs or other um, internship opportunities. Um, not at UMBC, although some may stay on campus too, but the, the primary of the model is that they, they do leave for the summer. So let's hear about your program, Michael. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Um, and actually we're in the throes um, or of our conference, I mean, of our um, recruitment process even now. Um, and so um, fall is really like there, this is where we start to bring them in and having conversations and, um, and informational sessions, et cetera, um, and connecting with, with the larger community. Um, and then um, there's workshops and engagement. So what we start is um, application starts in January um, and we do have a pre-program, but um, the way our function is our pre-program is called um, Friends of, well, it's two, Friends of McNair, um, which are our affiliates. There's a three level or three levels of engagement. So this is for anybody, um, ideally students who, um, who fit the um, McNair eligibility, eligibility. However, we're definitely open to others because we are, we are really like McNair is a loving community. And so we, we don't just um, um, exclude ourselves. So if people don't have a home and want to be connected with McNair in some way, we take them in um, and they learn with our students. They don't get the kind of funding support that our students get, but they can still attend. No harm in attending workshops, no harm in, you know, even me looking at a personal statement, no harm in us getting them connected to other people and networks on campus. And so um, again, um, that's something that we've just started implementing. Um, they can be acquaintances, uh, friends or best friends of the program, um, and those and that and them choosing their level allows them, and that those levels can change per semester depending on how the student wants to engage um, with the program. So that's our one of our pre McNair, and then the other part, it, we actually call it pre McNair. So the next step is pre McNair, um, but those are similar to how Christabel mentioned. They apply to the program, um, and we don't tell folks that like you have the option to be pre McNair. Uh, we at the end of the day, when we get to the table and look at all the applications, we determine who fits for pre McNair. Sometimes, like even this year, three three of our uh, we had three pre McNairs. Um, um, two out of the three were um, literally only there because we don't have any more spaces. Um, so because they are URMs, for instance, and URMs, you can only have one third, right? And so we don't want to let them go, right? Um, so we want them to be involved. They like, and we got people graduating next year or this year who are URMs. So the thought behind that is that y'all stay with us for this year. Um, and by this next cycle, which for us, for them, starting in January, because we'll now have a new set of students that we're serving now that the APR year is over, um, we can now include them. So starting in January, if they did everything they needed to do to move forward in the next process, they're the first people in the next cohort. Um, and so even before I, before I even look at applications, I will know how many students I need for URM or, or first gen, et cetera, because we have those students, um, we've already, those students have already secured spots in essence. Um, we don't take more than two or three pre McNairs, um, maybe three, you know, five is sort of like our max is, and we haven't even hit five. So it's been about three um, because they get that hands-on support um, through our staff, just like the other students. The pre, uh, everyone else will just be friends of McNair, acquaintances, et cetera, because that's just large group come be a part of what we're doing, et cetera. So there's no really one-on-one -on -one support that we provide. Um, and speaking of something that also differs between our models and something you might want us to talk about um, is there, um, is how we are budgeted, right? Because like for me, um, out my, my, my salary and my um, a coordinator salary um, and benefits all come out of the grants. And so that's almost almost um, one a half of the grant. So it's about one uh, when, you, when you add all the benefits and everything together, um, it's about maybe 40 
percent in essence of 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 our, our grant and so um we are mindful of that um and maybe even um a little bit more and i'll think about it but we're mindful of that um as we are thinking about um how we serve the students and while we encourage our students to go get reus elsewhere because we don't have money for them to do um to do uh for stipends so not all of our students get stipends um, which there are students who graduate our program in good standing and do phenomenal work and never receive the stipend from us at all. And that's because we've connected them with other spaces. We have LS Samp, LS Samp in the house. We got LS Samp on campus. And so they get funding from, I got students who get funding from that. And some of our students who are STEM, they end up going, you know, being both an LSM, uh, LS Samp scholar um, and then also a McNair scholar. And so we rarely, like them, I rarely give them money for stipends, um, um, but LSM helps them throughout the semester. So just something to think of uh, when they first get into our program. Um, so this, their first year, we do accept first years. So we applications due in January, we're accepting first years and sophomores at this time, ideally. And um, something else I wanted to point to that somebody said earlier, um, we, we have two of, it typically McNair's are two year programs. What ours is more like a three, maybe four year program, especially if you're bringing in a freshman and if they're there for four or five years, which is helpful to us because we're not having to recruit more students. It's helpful for the for them too, because what we notice, um, um, and I'm sure that there's research out there because one of the programs on our campus is called the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. Um, the, I, and I was a Meyerhoff Scholar when I was at UMBC too. Um, they start in the summer of the freshman year and stay with them all year. And the, the, the thought is the longer you're with a student, the more you're able to give them the resources and network and everything so that you know they are prepared. Yes, we have some students who decide to go a different route, but you'll have that. I had that more when I was just recruiting juniors and seniors um, because they didn't know exactly what they were doing or wanting to do or what have you. Um, and so now we have more time to prepare and I feel like we have less students who are wayward, going wayward um, in our sense, um, because we have more, um, they've been with us longer um, and, and have their networks taken care of. So um, their first year with us um, over the summer is where we continue to advise and be with them. Um, that's, it's not called the pre-program, um, that, that portion, um, that they're in the program at that point. So that summer there, they are McNair scholars, they're advising, um, they're taking a zero credit course with us over the summer that prepares them for the fall. Um, that, that course is library and writing. Uh, we have the um, library who helps us um, put together. It's a Blackboard course, but it's also they meet once a week. It's mostly asynchronous, but they meet once a week for a workshop. And it's only one month, so four, four weeks. Um, and the writing director has been working, has been um, the person who's been running that for us. And we give her a small stipend, um, not nowhere near as much as um, she deserves for what she um, has done with it and helping us to navigate it, but just something to say thank you um, um, for what she does. Um, so next slide, I think. So then when they come into the program at this point, um, they, we start a research methods course. So just like John, um, like I, and I totally feel you, John, we're trying to get the credit bearing. So ours is credit bearing, but it's been credit bearing for 30 years. Our program is 30 years Oh, right? And so it's, it started, as a part of the program, like our class is a part of the Africana Studies Department. Um, and so it will at least be there, you know, for the near future, but who knows the professor, Dr. Robinson, who taught me when I was a student is still teaching the class. Um, and he's great. Um, I, I've, um, two years ago, I sat in the class because I wasn't sure, you know, like the student, the students were saying one thing or acting, you know, like, oh, I'm, uh, he's dry, he's da da da, you know. And I'm like, and I never sat in the class. So I said, like, you know what, this semester I'm gonna sit in. Man, I had so much fun in his class, but then I'm old, you know, so hey, that could be the case, you know. Um, but then I decided this year, um, I'm co-teaching it with him and learning through the process and what have you that in the future, I'll probably be the one teaching the course um, um, as, as we go. But um, he's been phenomenal. Um, and actually we have a lecture series that we, we started this year as a part of our conference called the Hill Robinson McNair Lecture. And he's is named after his, in his honor and the, in order of our um, first director who um, started the McNair program at UMBC and was there for 25 years. Um, and so the students there, they doing this class, 
lit review, everything John was talking about and, and even Christopher was about their class and everything. We do all of that during that time. Um, the first two hours of the class, it's like a two and a half hour class. So the first hour and a half is with Dr. Robinson um, sort of lecturing in essence about, about things and having dialogue and conversation with the students. Um, and then um, the last half is what we call the workshop portion. Um, and that's led by a teaching fellow, which is a McNair scholar who is now a senior in the class. Um, so it's like, take, think of it as like the TA, um, but they do and help them navigate some of the levels of preparing for the research um, proposal that is due. They, they bring in speakers to help them through the process and thinking the, one of the first thing they did was had a speaker to talk about their legacy statement because it's important if you're gonna do this work to understand why you're doing this work, right? And so that's where they start. And then we have other things to build on that throughout the time, right? Um, and so, and then had one of our students alums who's now at UMBC um, in her master's program, she came back and did a workshop um, for the class during that time around um, lit review, right? The difference between a lit review and a annotated bi bibliography, right? And how do you go between that? And she was phenomenal, like she, uh, it, it was great. So that's the other thing I would say is lean on alums, lean on the students, because that's what we do. We, we lean heavily, I could not do what I do without the support of my students. And we have a strong student staff as well, which I can talk to you about that as well. And then that prepares them. They do, they present their research. They do a um, um, presentation over it, a part of the class. All of this is in the class. So that then um, at the end of spring, at, I mean, at the end of fall, they can apply to our scholar research um, institute, which is in the spring. Um, and so they can apply to it now, again, we don't got the money to fund everybody for it. So you got to be, you got to do what you need to do in the class, do what you need to be doing in our program. Um, um, this past year, because of the pandemic, we, we did fund everybody, I ain't gonna lie to you. We funded everybody because we had the money, right? We weren't traveling, we weren't doing nothing. Um, and so everybody, you know, um, stipends for everybody. You know, I felt like Oprah, you know, but I told him Oprah is gone, you know, by Harpo, you know, as they would say, by Harpo. no, not happening this year. So you got to show up, right? You got to do what you need to do. Um, because funding is smaller this year because we're we're sort of preparing for summer travel or things of that sort and seniors who want to visit grad schools we're thinking about all of that as well and so um they get a stipend now here's the other thing to highlight the grant says up to 2800 which does not say you have to give them 2800 and so what we've done was over the semester for instance this year if they doing if they get accepted into the scholar research they get um, up to fifteen hundred dollars, right, for the semester, right. Over the summer, we would give the full thing up to twenty eight hundred, um, et cetera, you know, and and have some, um, you know, halfway points and marks, and then they don't get their final. We we break it into three, where they don't get their final until everything has been turned in. So it's like five hundred for this year. It's going to be five hundred. Um, or sometimes I just do the thousand. Sometimes I just do two because it makes it easy. So give them the thousand up front. Give them the five hundred at the end. You know. Um, so we we'll, we sometimes um, do it in that way to sort of help. But it's normally five, five, and five as well. Um, and then um, over the summer. So the, the oh, one of the things I didn't say is that in the fall they're also preparing for REUs. So they're doing work. They're doing um, filling out applications. You know, we just had a boot camp yesterday where we were there all day and they were working on applications and anything they need to do on their own. Students are required to attend at least one boot camp a semester. We provide two. You gotta choose, you choose one that you're you're in. It's all day, nine to five. We provide breakfast and lunch um, and 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 support right there. And so um that's what they're doing now because again, we don't have the money, right? The way our grant is set up, we can't give you all stipends over the summer. So the goal is, and, and here's the thing, why would you want my 2800 where you can go elsewhere and get 6,000, 6, right? Um, or 5,000, right? And so, um, and housing and the experience of going to another campus that you are interested in applying to. So that's the big difference too, that we say your REU should match your grad school list. Um, and that's the goal that we do because I'm like, like, now you can either say, yes, I want to go here, or uh, yeah, no. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this at the bottom of the list now, right? Um, and think about it. If you get sophomores, they get like two or three years 
of doing that. So that means that they'll have three schools that they could actually choose from and have the experience. And to Christabel's point too about recommendations, they'll have at least three or four recommenders. That's not just their research mentor that they had at UMBC. Um, so um, next slide. And then they, re they, they uh, let me say this right, they do um, present their research at other institutions. So we do work with their REUs to say, hey, we want the student to go to this conference or the student works, like they, they talk to the people to say, hey, can I go to this conference to present my research that I just did in the spring, right, um, et cetera. And so they, they oftentimes, I rarely have um, folks who don't work with us um, to make it happen, but we have like three or four conferences over the summer. So I'm like, it might not be the one you really want, but there's one here that I know you could fit with your REU schedule. Next. And um, again, to, <laughs> To John, I guess both all of our points, like the senior year, it looks little, but whoo, it ain't. Um, there's, there's a lot there now. And John, you said something that was great that I remind my students of all, all the time. I think it was you, where you said, like, this is like a three credit course. Um, and you like, and so you need to think about that. So the great thing about getting them early is that you can prepare their, help them to prepare their courses so that they do treat this like a three credit and add it to their thing. So you shouldn't be taking 17 credits that, that fall semester because you really you're taking 20, right? Um, and so knowing the weight of that for students, it's important for us to talk that out with them and say, okay, now like plan out your schedule. If that means you got to take a winter course, summer course, like let's think about this, you know, so that that, that fall semester, you, you don't have a lot there. But also our rule of thumb too is the summer. That, that if you've been with us long enough, by September 1st, your application should be ready to go. And if your application is ready to go by September 1st, then all you're doing is waiting for your, your um, recommenders. And you sent them everything because all, all your stuff is, is sort of set. Have we hit that strive yet? Not fully, you know, because um, they, they, don't, they don't hear it, but the but I'm getting them to tell the younger students or the students who have like, oh, I wish I would have listened, right? I wish I would have heard this. I wish I, I would have picked, I heard it, but I didn't really um, think it through in that way. And that has been very powerful to hear them talk with the other students. So now our graduating seniors are actually having those conversations with the sophomores and juniors that we have don't, today. Don't you love that, Michael, when the students are like, oh yeah, I wish I would have listened to Michael. He knew what he was talking about all along. I exactly. Have. You're like, Ugh, like uh, let me say this. Right, right. And that's, but then I, I, I've learned though, over the time of doing this too, and even like you can come in and tell them the same thing. And they're like, oh, Dr. Bell, they're saying such and such and such and such. And you know what? I'm going to change my life of this and i'm like okay as long as your life has changed i said that to you last week but as long as it's changed now i'm good right i just wanted to change <laughs> you know um and so so this is this so we're doing the same thing spring we're helping them think through one of the differences is that we do have a um a grad in the summer too they meet at least at least twice a month um sometimes weekly as the senior support group is what we call it so they meet together by themselves without us and then one of the weeks, one or two of the weeks, we meet with them to talk about what they, other questions they have. And that support um, is, is, is it, one, we don't have the capacity to help all of them individually through the whole process, right? We just don't, especially what we, how we built this program out. There's many elements that we have. However, they've learned how to support each other. And we also provide a strong mentoring um, component. Um, my focus and my research is around holistic critical mentoring. And so that is, is essential in the work that we do. And so when they first come into the program, they're, they're paired with a McNair mentor, which is a faculty or staff who is not in their major, um, but someone to connect with them. They meet once a month with this individual. Um, the, 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 um, there's a form that the advisor um, or the mentor fills out that just gives us some ideas of what they talked about or concerns they might have or support that's needed. Um, but that's, that's we, we, um, what do we, we pair them with their McNair mentor. Then over the summer, when they're in that um, research, um, that um, library component, 
um, and library and writing, that's when they're looking and getting their own research mentor to help them for the fall research course. And so we help them to navigate that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say too, is that we, we've also in the midst um, this this spring, we will be starting our um, mentor training. And so we have um, a mentor training around first gen that we've done with the first gen network on campus. And it's a whole blackboard, you know, or it's not, it's another um, arc, something course arc or something like that, um, that um, training. And then McNair, we're doing a supplemental training to that as well. And we, that will be done by next next fall. We will sort of institute that, but we're in the working process so that one, one of the things, and especially with my research that I've noticed is that there is no training for mentors. And so everyone's just signing up to be mentored or to be a mentor, but no one is giving them the skill set, especially thinking in a holistic critical way. I'll stop there. Uh, Michael, real quick on that training, is that for the McNair mentors outside of their major, the uh, McNair mentors who are their research advisors or both? Both all, we also have, um, we have alumni mentors, we have um, wisdom mentors, wisdom mentors are, are paired with the graduating seniors, meet once a month with them, these are retirees from UMBC who, and, and who are um, um, faculty and staff retirees and different majors and they meet with them to talk about the transition, you know, um, from, from undergrad to grad um, to life, et cetera. And so all, if you mentoring our students, this you will be required to do the training. And it lasts you for like five years as what we're saying. So after you do it once, you can mentor as many of our students as you want to. Um, and then there'll be some things that we actually do to sort of re-up your commitment um, to um, the work that we do. Okay, thanks for clarifying. All right. All right. So this brings us to our second half of the agenda. Um, so we've talked about models um, of these programs um, and uh, just a general structure of, of what's kind of allowable within the scope of what a McNair Scholars Program is. Um, and we've heard from three really different programs, of course, some overlapping themes amongst all of you, some common threads, but, but each having some really distinct features. Um, and so now I want to have some time just to actually get to talk with you all. Um, and ask questions, but also for our audience to get to ask questions um, of you. And so before I jump into my questions, um, I'd love to hear um, from a few folks who are willing to share what they are hoping to get, um, you know, out of today's session. If there's some burning questions that you all have that we can kind of prioritize, but I also have a huge list of questions as well. Um, but I'd love to hear from, from, get some audience participation here. So you could either do the raise, go ahead and do the raise your hand feature and then um uh, if we can have uh kelsey maybe call on folks as she sees their hands raised uh so that we don't talk over one another can i also ask if is it possible for folks just to put even put in the chat who you are and um your um institution or something so that we sort of know who's in the room too Yes, Kelsey will have to enable our uh, chat for us to do that. But Kelsey, if you could do that, then uh, we can ask that of folks if they could say where they're coming from. That'd be great to see. Absolutely. Who's in the room. Yep, Thank the, you. The chat should be open now. Okay, great. Not all at once, professionals. And then again, if you have some burning questions, if you could use the raise your hand feature and we'll uh, we'll try to call on you and uh, get some conversation going just to see what are you hoping to get out of today's session? Ooh, Texas in the house. I was gonna say, look at that, John. Texas, you love it. All right. Looks like we've oh perfect. We have someone raising our hand. I can't see your name. Hi, oh. sorry, I'm Lynn. Perfect, Lynn, welcome. Well, first, thank you all. Um, I've 
I think I took about four pages of notes. It's really helpful to hear about some different models. Um, I think one thing that I'm thinking about um, as I'm kind of getting into more of the nitty gritty, gritty of the proposal writing is again, just getting the buy-in from folks when we're all as tapped as we are and our plates are as full as they are. Um, and I think that's true on both the faculty and staff side um, to be asking for that commitment for that one more thing and creative ways um, where we can still demonstrate value and give some type of appreciation for people's effort, even when that can't always be through things like release time or you know, additional salary, things like that. That's a great question. Buy-in is so, so important in writing the grant, but also in actually executing it. I feel you because I'm, look, I'm tired. Um, and so I, I know asking, doing the ask for folks, we're aware. So what we do, let me tell you, because I just met with my team this week. One of the things that we do is, one, you don't need the letter. You, well, not that you don't, you're not supposed to send the letters, right? So you don't need the letters. You just, you just need to have them. It'll be helpful for you in the future. Right when you're when and but you need to be able to write about the people or the things that you want to support. So so that's one thing. So um, what we typically do is, and um, I learned this from my boss who did our last grant. She said, you know, I just have them send me an email, um, saying that they're going to support in some way that they will support, and I follow away that e that email. Right, I print it out and put it in the folder. Right. Um. So something let make it low level. Not with any. We don't need letterhead. That was one thing she was saying. Like, then don't need letterhead. You don't. You just need to be able to make a list, in essence, of what what the people are saying. So that's one one thing. The second thing I would say is, you you pretty much most institutions already do the things. It's now just having that as a part of this program. So uh, John mentioned the career center. Everybody on here got a career center, right? They already do a workshop on resume. Now you're connected with the career center because they're gonna come or you're gonna send your student. Cause sometimes you don't even have to, um, it's not about them coming. It's also about sending your students, right? So they're already doing a workshop on resume. You don't have to do another one or they don't have to come to yours. You send your students to that, right? Um, and then having something where now the students you know, send you the copy of the resume after they've done it or something, you know, whatever you want to do to show that they've, they've gotten there. But I would say that is, you know, it's not about reinventing the wheel. Think about what you are, the support systems that are already there and how can you capitalize on those and make it low level where the people can say, hey, we already do this. Yes. And we need to support more students and we need to support more first gen students and low income. Yes. Let, let sign me up um, to support that. To add to that, one thing that I've learned is that a lot of programs in like, like the Career Center, the Writing Center, you know, different places, they're all looking to boost their participation rates and their numbers. And if I can give them McNair Scholars that's like a guaranteed 30, and then if I include my Explorer, that's another 25, like a guaranteed boost, you know, to whatever, that's, I haven't had to do a lot of hard asks. So the Career Center was like more than happy to do customized things for us. Um, we had the Writing Center come in and talk about their services. And they were so impressed with our scholar. They said, hey, what would you think about doing a McNair specific writing group just for your scholars? And I was like, well, what do I need to do? He goes, you don't need to do anything other than just give us their names. We'll take care of all the recruitment and all the stuff for setting it up. And I was like, awesome. So I have found that, um, by just introducing our scholars that, um, you know, we, we've gotten a lot of opportunities that I hadn't even thought of. This is those community partners, just because your scholars tend to be the cream of the crop. I mean, they're, they're the high achieving students that for the most part tend to participate in things. You know, there's always, you know, exceptions to the rule, but um, I have found that I've now had, you know, other organizations that I reached out to, hey, what can we do partnership wise? Um, and that's a lot of those, you know, those student-based organizations that are trying to provide some service. They're all trying to boost. Where I've had issues is on like the department and college level of getting the faculty to do beyond just being a mentor. Like I haven't had an issue finding mentors. That hasn't been a problem, but just other things. And so 
I created a structure of what McNair can provide for their department. We provide an undergraduate research that's interdisciplinary. We're not just STEM, especially my, I'm a history person. So I reach out to the history and the political science. We go, oh, you have funding for our students to do research? I'm like, yeah, if they meet these requirements, we can do that. And so when I first got to Texas Tech, we were 100% STEM, and which is fine. You know, I can, I can, I'm actually turning away so many STEM students because they're just all very much that research minded. Well, as I started to reach out to our humanities and social sciences, I now am about 60% STEM, 40% humanities, just because we've got some faculty partners that realize, hey, this is a resource that isn't just STEM, because we have other programs that are STEM only. Like we have, we just got an LSAM, and so that's going to be another STEM thing. And so I'm like, hey, we're interdisciplinary, we want it. So I've got a musician, I've got a historian, I've got um, a graphic designer, you know, all these other things that are bringing, it brings a lot of variety in, but now people, I, my recruiting is way, you know, is a lot easier because I have a couple of faculty members that every year send me two or three students. And no guarantee that we'll accept all of theirs, but they've kind of learned what types of students we're looking for. And so there's a better chance that, that student is going to get accepted if they're the right, you know, want to get a PhD, want to do research and then meet our other eligibility requirements. And so it's made my recruitment a lot easier since my first year when I had to like beg and, and, and you know, scream at the top of my lungs into the void. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I'm at a huge university. We have over 40,000 students. 25% um, of them are first gen, and then a smaller, you know, then a larger percentage of that 25% is low income as well. So I have a huge group. It's just a matter of getting them to to apply. And you know, who wants to go to grad school? So that lowers it even more. So it's I'm blessed in that way. But you know, I'm seeing University of Missouri that has a program, and I'm seeing Texas A&M that has a huge student population. So. Um, you know, the need section in some ways kind of writes itself to a certain extent because there's there's a large population that are that are that need the support that we can provide. But that's the key is for me is just um, self promote, um, go out and just make appointments with anybody and everybody that can do it. And then usually after you get the grant, you'll realize, oh, there's this need who can provide that because also the students get tired of hearing from John, Michael, Tammy, Christabel, they want to hear from somebody else. And if you can get another community partner into the into your office, then you can tell your bosses, look, look at all these partnerships I'm doing and what they're doing. And, and that always makes your program look good that you're not siloing, which McNair sometimes has a reputation of siloing itself. Um, and that's something we as MAP officers have really been pushing to say, let's not silo anymore. We need to be um, the, the phrase that I've coined throughout my, my presidency is that we are small but mighty, you know, that, you know, we are bringing one, 1 1.2 to $1.6 million to the university over, over a period of time. So that's, yes, in the large scheme of things for some universities, that's a smaller amount, but that's still a lot of money. So, um, you know, use that to your, your advantage. Looks like we have another raised question. Hi, I'm Laura Lynn from Illinois Wesleyan University. I was wondering if um, someone or, oh, I'm sorry, did I jump in front of somebody? <laughs> no, okay. Um, I was wondering if somebody could expand on evaluating your applicants. And I've seen one or two examples of rubrics um, and most people talk about an interview process. If you could um, elaborate a little bit on how you evaluate and especially in that interview, what are, what are you asking and what are you trying to hear from those students as you're talking to them? Thanks. I'll jump in for this, this to start us out on this one. Um, I'm really interested in ensuring that the student is um, committed to a PhD. So there's there's a few things um, if you're if you're becoming familiar with the grant and the sort of measurements that that the that the grantee is sort of um, reporting on. Um, we need to report on 
how many students graduate with their bachelor's and then enter into a graduate degree or graduate program, excuse me, and then continue on their second year, get a PhD. Um, what am I missing? That's three of four. There's a fourth one. Help me out, folks. Finish scholarly um, ah. research yes. and scholarly activity. Yes. So that's the stuff you do when they're in the program. And so I think about those things like I feel like we've got that part. No problem. Right. The first one, the scholarly activities. No problem. I think about and the where I've seen it for our program in particular with alumni go go wonky, if you will, and us not get the points that we need um, is us tracking uh, and making sure and really encouraging students to complete um, that, that next step of getting into grad school or then continuing with grad school and, and getting their PhD. So um, for me, I, I look back at that and I've seen, especially with COVID, it's really thrown a monkey wrench into students' motivation. And they're like, a lot of them are like, I'm taking a gap year. Well, McNair doesn't like that. At the moment, until legislation changes, <laughs> McNair does not like the gap year. It is not like something we are cool with. And so I have to push against this sort of culture a bit with, you know, wanting to do that. Um, we so for me that has then come back to the interview stage where i really evaluate students commitment to going into grad school right after their bachelor's degree not taking a gap year if i hear gap year it's like a bad word, dirty word to me i'm like nope <laughs> all right we're not doing that and so, so so or i have a really serious conversation like i really need you to go to grad school um kind of thing but even though, but it's not like that i haven't had any students who who i've had to really have that conversation with i really just won't bring them in if they really want to take a gap year. Um, it's pretty simple. And then the other thing is the PhD. That's the other part for me. So a lot of students are, it's, it's almost hard for us, I think, to uh, expect that they kind of have their whole life laid out for them already, right? And like their goals and things change naturally with research. And the more that they learn, the more they realize they learn about themselves. And then they start kind of questioning, wait, did I want a PhD? Is that really what I want to commit to? Sometimes those things happen. That's totally okay and natural, but I kind of try to pre-correct for that by ensuring that the students, I give them a good enough, hopefully, a good enough sort of onboarding that sophomore year is what I'm thinking, and I get to know them well enough and I expose them to enough things so that by the time they transition or they're interviewing for the McNair program in their junior year, that they, they really are pretty certain that they want to continue doing a PhD, right? So those are kind of, for me, the big things. It's not a quantitative thing. It's it's a much more qualitative thing. Um, I could get into the, qual the quant stuff, but um, I think for me, those are the two ones recently that have been really um, big. Yeah, I mean, I echo everything Christabel just said is like it's a lot of it is for me is I'm looking for that potential um a lot of you know if you if you're familiar with the research on first gen students a lot of them come into they want to be a lawyer they want to be a doctor they want to be a teacher they don't really know what grad school is so one of the reasons why I created the explorers program was to teach them what it is so I'm taking less risks when I bring a student in of whether or not they are going to go into grad school because again we're interviewing sophomores. I mean they I mean they don't even know what they're doing tomorrow, let alone four years from now. And so it's really trying to get them to think forward and think about what it means. Because some of them they just see research and they go, well I want to do McNair because I want to do research. But then when we in the interview and also we have them write an essay um, about like what it is they want to research and why do they want to go to grad school. So we get them to start thinking about it. And we do a lot of like of information sessions that talk about it. And so we try to prep them for it. But our interview is very much conversational. It's, I say, hey, you're interviewing us just as much as we're interviewing you. We want to make sure that this is a good fit because we're only bringing in 13 a year. It's highly selective. We want to make sure that you're going to be happy because if this is not the path that you even want to, to think about, then it's, it's going to be a rough you know, rough two years with us because a lot of our stuff is embedded with preparing for graduate school. Now, not to say I don't have seniors that sometimes come to me and go, hey, Dr. Kreider, I, grad school's just not in the books for me because of X, Y, Z. And there's a billion different legitimate reasons for that. 
and it's not like I kicked them out. It's not like I forced them to do anything, but we do have a serious conversation about, well, what are you going to do? And that's something that I tell my seniors that are kind of wavering is like, look, apply to grad school so you have options. Then make the final decision in the spring about whether or not you want to go because I've had a couple of seniors that don't apply. And then in the spring, they're like, damn it. <laughs> like, what am I going to do now? And I'm like, dude. So we try to find like a master's program that has a late acceptance date or something like that. And we're scrambling. And I'm trying to eliminate that rush at the end. And so it's it's working with it. And the great thing about having a pre McNair program is you've already gotten to know the student for a year. They've gotten to know you and there's no hidden expectations. Because sometimes scholars get brought in and they're like, well, I didn't realize this. I'm like, dude, we talked about this like, you know, a couple of times during the interview, a couple of times this, but with the explorers, it's one year of us bringing it up. And so that helps us make sure we're bringing in students that are really focused. Not to say we don't bring in the, what, you know, we kind of call it like, okay, this student we're taking is somewhat risk for meeting our goals, but there, I see a lot of potential for the students and they just don't really know what they want, but they, I can, I can see that drop. They have all the characteristics of someone who's going to be successful in grad school so that you know that genesis and you know, i think directors after a while we kind of get a but you know the one student we think is a, is a slam bunk ends up being you know not going to grad school and the one student are like man this kid goes to grad school it's going to be a stretch they end up being the one that goes to harvard with a full ride and all the fellowships and so i've learned never to underestimate my students because um we give them the opportunity and they it's up to them to either grab it and run or not. And, you know, that's where we provide them that agency. Uh, before we go, I, I want to add um, to, to, to what John said, the, um, what I, I learned that too, you, you just, you, you, you never, as director, I do get the final say as to who is in the program. So I make that clear, but our process um, over the last three or four years, we've changed the process. And so now we start off with reviewing the application, um, especially for eligibility and all. But then if, if they if they're eligible and you know they, they did a good job with just providing the application, we're not going into details with it yet. But um everyone is pretty much invited to what we call a group interview. And um if you've ever done student life or res life, um, I remember this from my res life days as a as a um as a um RA, not an RA, I was a, uh, a resident hall director. And um, um, what we do is put them in groups, um, meet on campus, they go from room to room, they get to know their group, they do activities um, and all that, that's a part of the group interview, but that they are and, um, evaluated. Um, our current scholars are evaluators, alums are evaluators, faculty, staff, any community, uh, we call our community of supporters. They're all there to evaluate um, and we make it fun. It's a fun experience. It's their first entry into McNair of seeing who we are to John's point about, you know, you're making a decision on us. So we want it to be where you're excited about this. They come in not knowing what to expect. We don't go into detail. We just tell them it's a group interview. And when they leave, they're like, I, I didn't expect this. Like this was not what I thought this would be. I mean, they're building Legos doing Lego activity and creating something and having to recreate something. They're having conversations, ethical related conversations about who dies on the boat and who doesn't or something like that. When we say the spaceship, I think it is. You only get to take a certain many people to the spaceship. You know, how many, who do you take, you know? And so we do these different activities um, for about three or four hours and that's their first entry, right? Um, and then we also, again, it's not just me making the decisions. I don't even participate in the rooms. Um, I don't, I, I might walk around and see, but all the evaluators are supporters of the program, right? Um, and then they do a great job on that. And if they sort of hit a certain score, we have, we do have them scored or what have you. Um, but most of the time we like the scores are high because our people, McNair, McNair are loving people. So they always scoring everybody, high, you know? And so um, mostly everyone is then invited to the next level, um, which is interview. And so they're individual interviews at that point um, where they sign up um, and during that time though, again, I'm there, but the interviewers are like four or five other people 
It's a panel. Now we're doing it virtual and we probably will continue the virtual thing. Now it was in person and we would do it, but I like the idea of virtual because we also record it for them. And then they also will get a copy of the recording once they enter into the program, right? Um, they, they sort of have, have that access to it. And then we use that to talk about interview um, process and what, you know, how do you, did you prepare well for this? Or what could you have done? What did you do well, et cetera. So we, we use that as a teachable moment as well. But that those people who are there, again, McNair scholars, all McNair scholars are required to participate in the uh, recruitment effort um, at group interview, everyone's required to be there. And then individual interviews, if they get credit, um, there's this whole process around portfolio enhancements and they have to do it in service each semester before McNair. Um, and um, if they do at least three interviews, um, they, they can count that as an in service. Um, for the program, but we don't require it. They just need to tell us what their schedule are because not everyone can meet interviewer. And so we're not going to require you to do it if you got class, you know, or something of that sort. So we're we're mindful of that. But again, we we take that as the staff, they, they their application. Um, oh, and after each of those parts, so after the group interview and after the individual interview, they do a self-reflection um, form that talks about you know anything else they want to say because the shoulda, coulda, woulda is what I wish I would have said, what I wish I would have done, I didn't do. They get the chance to share that. Any feedback for us that they think, well, well, and we tell them on there, I was like, our program is only as great as our students make it. And so your feedback has, uh, feedback from previous folks have helped make it better. So we do evaluate you on you being critical of the program. We want you to be critical. We want you to think about what could we have done better, what have you. And if you're able to do that now, then we know that in the program, you're going to be helping us to create something and continue to create something great for, for generations to come. And so we do that, all of that stuff we take, right? And then we sit at the table. Um, and it's a holistic approach for us, right? It's not just the numbers, it's not a cutoff thing. We look at every aspect. One of the things we change this year, um, and thank goodness for the pandemic and um, dismantle the GREs. I just want to add that I haven't said that today. Uh, I need to say it at least one time in every session that I'm ever in. Um, that that test needs to go. But I but but um, because of um, the, the the value of equity, we have removed the requirement of having them turn in um, um, recommendation letters. Right. One, I wasn't even really looking at them and everybody's saying everything great about the students anyway in it. So it really didn't like we weren't using it in a great way. And I don't like the process. If we were to do it again. We would do something different. Uh, but we removed it. And now we just asked for two names of references that we could reach out to, you know, on your behalf. And one, if you got first year students coming into the program, they, they're scrambled. They, it's going to be hard for them to use one semester to get a good letter of recommendation. And so that's something that we've sort of been thinking about is the letter writing, um, uh, removing that as an obstacle um, and thinking about the whole process. And then our McNair Advisory Council, we set that up two years ago, which was one of the greatest things we've done. They, again, advise me and support the program and what we do. And I remember us talking to the recruitment um, subcommittee there and one of the leaders there she's one of the vps at umbc um and again we we set up the advi uh, advisory council is another thing you should probably do but we don't do it based on on title she's just a vp i just say that because that's who she is she's her name is yvette and that's who she is to us she's yvette right um, um and and but she she's a first gen person she cares about the work that's the people we look for are people who care about the work and we don't care about your title we care if you care about our students about the work we do Etc. And I think that sometimes people set up the advisory council so they can have all these top people on, you know, from the, the, the dean of this, da da da. And you're really, it's really then just about title and not about the work of all students. And one thing she said that really echoed this, she said, um, Michael, you got to really think about what barriers are we creating for students to actually to apply. Right. right. Let's look at the application. Let's think about all this. What what is missing there? And so we took her advice. We removed we, one of the things we did, move the, the letters of recommendation. We also provided a day where they can sign up to get application help from us virtually. Right. And so they can just come this year. We're going to do it where we have a Zoom room and they just come in. We'll be there all day. And then they can also sign up for individual meetings where we'll go into a breakout room and meet with them individually. I know that was a lot, but I just wanted you to think about something different. Um, about how you're doing your recruitment process. 
So thanks, Michael. Um, and always, Michael is like the example of all of the things we should aim for um, in our approaches. I'll offer quickly um, just logistically how that Wellesley did this. And then um, Melanie, I see that you have your hand raised, so you'll be next up for questions. Um, but we are we only have about 11 minutes left, so we're going to have to be a little more concise to make sure we can get a lot of questions if, if folks have them. Um, so I'll say at Wellesley, what we did was the students applied, you know, paper applications application. Um, we had our advisory board, which included faculty, um, staff and friends, right? Um, again, people who are first gen, who are um, low income, who are uh, people of color, who, you know, get the program, support the program, that kind of stuff. Um, they would uh, rank them, you know, one was best score, two was middle, three was, you know, um, needs improvement. And, um, and then we would have interviews. And so we tried to have interviews with all of the students who applied. So one on one interview, views again um including as many folks from the advisory board as we could. And we also included McNair alumni as part of that. So we always made sure that there was at least one alum um, as part of that selection committee. Um, and then uh, once we had the interviews, then we would meet a third time. So the first time, you know, they're sending their scores. So a virtual meeting, the second time they're there for the interviews, 15 minutes long. And then the third time was an actual physical meeting, again, talking about all of these students. And so um, again, we're having to manage this really difficult balance of two thirds, one third. So that's a whole other piece of selection that we didn't really touch on. And then the other piece that I think is really important when you're sitting in those selection committees is this question of like, is this, you know, this question of does this person need the program? So occasionally you get these students who again are like these all stars who you're like, they're going to go to grad school, whether I help them or not. And there's these other ones like John talked about that are like the risk ones where you're like, I don't know if they're going to make it, but gosh, do I want to give them a chance and see if we can help them get there, right? And so that is a really difficult part of the conversation in those deliberations. And so I just want to honor that because it is really challenging to figure out what's the right makeup um, of that cohort. And I think going back to John's uh, point, like you never know uh, how it's going to shake out in the end after two years of being in the program. So I'll pause there on kind of selection um, and, and get to Melanie's question because uh, she's had her hand raised for a while. <laughs> And you're muted right now if you're talking, Melanie. Yes, hi everyone, and, and thank you for this. Um, thank you for this workshop. Actually, I, I was a participant in the McNair program, and actually, you guys having those explore, <laughs> right? Right, because actually, it wasn't at my institution. It, it was, I was from the early days of McNair, um, 1994, and um, actually, it was run like an REU. I stumbled upon it because I didn't want to go home for the summer. I was a sophomore and discovered it. And, um, but I, I like your model and I see now that it's very much important that it's run at the institution so that you can have this time with the students like continuously, because I look for this program that I participated in. It doesn't exist anymore at that institution. And I'm like, ah, and, and the students who participated, I'm gonna say 80% of us weren't from the institution. And uh, like I said, it was early days, I'm a mathematician. And so even trying to get the buy-in from the professors and all of that, I was, me and another guy participated as math students. We didn't work with a faculty from the institution. Um, we did, but not really. He was a visiting professor who actually bought into the idea of increasing diversity within the field and all of that. And he's the one who shared with us. We didn't know like he that he wasn't <laughs> full time, but I think this is great. So I teach at a community college actually, and I'm trying to do more to get my students, when I see them first day, I'm already talking about what the end is in mind, like start with the end in mind, right? And so, um, McNair is wonderful, but I know it's not really for the community college. However, I would like to know, do you guys know um, if there is a component, um, some partnerships or um, alliances that exist with community colleges already? Because that's what I'm interested in, in making sure that my students can have this continued support when they leave me. I'd love to jump in. I'm so excited, Melanie. Thank you so much for asking and thank you for being here. I'm a transfer student myself and we, I am dead. And I would say, I think 29% maybe of our student population at the University of Oregon is transfer students. And it's actually 
about 60% in our program. So about 60% of our participants are transfer students. In addition to the other eligibility criteria, it's not an eligibility criteria, but I say that to give you a little context that that's that's the majority we work with actually. And I'm, I'm really excited that you are um, asking this question because we are trying to figure this out actually as we speak one of the best ways so far that we've figured this out is is or at least to partner with um our community colleges locally here in oregon is through trio sss um that seems to be the like kind of best pipeline um but it's really us meeting with just one-on-one -on -one with the folks in the community college in trio sss and just uh, providing them information about timelines and what the program's about, things like that. So far, that's where we're at. And and um, I I didn't find out about McNair through my community college, um, but I'm so happy I did as soon as I landed on campus. Um, but I think it would be so much easier for us to, to connect earlier. Um, and I think it's just a matter of us making those connections one-on-one -on -one with folks, you know, between program directors and faculty and, and whatnot. Can, can I just add that um, I, I, Christabel wrote it in, but I think that's another important fact is that um, finding faculty outside. So the grant just talks about faculty. And if you write it in a way, you don't have to write it just around faculty at your institution. And so what I often, and that's the other thing about my training, um, we're doing this training because not all of our faculty need to be working with our students. Let me just, I'm just gonna say that. Um, and so, so I make it clear that like if if we can't find you someone that understands and supports the the direction of McNair understand the needs of first gen low income students students from historically excluded community i will reach out and and see who else in our larger network of faculty um can provide you um that support and mentor you so note that melanie because you're at a community college what i would say is what are the larger institutions around you that may have a McNair program or may be willing to write a McNair program? Because then it's sort of like you become a support system. Your institution can become a support system with the, your faculty helping to support those students. And or um, we also work with at UMBC, we, um, we're connected with the Mo Montgomery College, for instance, and a lot of our transfer students come from Montgomery College. So we work with the SSS program as a part of our recruitment strategy um, for those who are transferring. And like, this is the moment. So they need to know about McNair before they even come to UMBC. So that's one of the things that we do. So we'll do the recruitment. But if you really want to get more hands on, I would say just figure out who around you may be also writing or should be writing, but maybe that's what it is. Like we should be having a partnership writing thing so that as you are preparing students, like I am our institution at the community college, because other programs they do, you can do a McNair program with a collection of schools. Um, so that, so keep that in mind, that is possible. I don't know. I don't know if there is any McNair's at community college. I don't, like anybody know i don't know if there are but i don't think so but um but i can see the connection where you know they start with you go on to this institution and then y'all are supporting the student together that's just my um my thoughts thank you yeah i would your programs are eligible to apply but i don't think there are any at least that i'm aware of any current that are from two of your schools because that's pretty hard because you're dealing with first years and sophomores so a lot of them kind of self <laughs> cycled out. Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend trying to partner or um, thinking about an SSS the next cycle um, for that. But, you know, while people are writing, start reaching out to folks. I see that you're in the like Chicago area, you know, reach out to schools, see if they have a McNair, if they're writing for McNair and you guys could partner together for sure. So um, and Samuel, you had your hand up. All right, thank you so much. Thank you all uh, to all of the panelists. I really appreciate all of your expertise and the work that you do. I wanted to um, ask Michael if he could please share a little bit more about the partnership that he has with his LSM um, on campus to sponsor some of the McNair student stipends. Are there any issues or considerations that you have to uh, be aware of in terms of double counting the students in both of the programs? And then to all of the panelists, are there any collaborations that you have with your LSM programs? I know, John, you said that uh, Texas Tech had just got awarded an LSM. 
but what type of collaborations do you have with LSM programs on your campuses or regionally? Well, I'll start by saying our um, our coordinator, um, LSM is a part, it's in our office. We're connected with us in the grad school um, and um, our academic opportunity programs. And actually, when I first came to this role as, as assistant director, we shared the coordinator for LSM and McNair. So that person did halftime McNair, halftime LSM. I was like, you know, I love I love y'all LSM, but I need my own person. Right. I, I'm just going to be honest. Like we, I, this is too much work that we're trying to do. I, I need a full time and LSM could afford it full time. And we did adjustments in our budget, you know, to be able to have a full time coordinator. So now we have a full time coordinator um, and LSM has theirs and he's next door to us. And so we're like all three of us, our office are next doors. Um, we're connected. We email, text each other. So it really is a, a, a um, strong relationship. And even when he was in the role, he, he worked with our students, but all of our students are required, if they're STEM, they're required to sign up for LSM. Um, if they if they count, you know, in, in, in the um, um, a historically ex excluded uh, racial group, what have you, like they, they, they become. Now they have their own requirements. So the, it's the double, and people talk about this often, the double dipping, the way in which we look at it, is that we don't, again, I told you, we don't give everyone stipends at, all the time, right? So like I said, the, 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 the resource that they're getting from LSM, we're not giving to them from our aspect. But even if we did pay them a stipend, they would be doing different kinds of work or different kinds of experiences or requirements for us than they did with LSM. Um, and so, so the resources and the support system that we're providing would not be the same as they're getting from LSM. Um, um, so that, that's that's one thing, but it does make a stronger student, a stronger applicant um, in many ways, like when they go into grad school, showing that they have the support of both the LSM program and the McNair program. And there's some other, like we have other scholars program where students are a part of ours and the other, but we work with their staff. And LSM is, ours is, is very touch, like low touch, we're touching. LSM is really large scale um, in that sense, um, unless the students is doing direct research, then they're meeting more often with the coordinator, but the coordinator knows they're a McNair scholar, they're getting some of that advising, et cetera, so they're not going to have to put as much energy into it with that student as their other students who are not connected with McNair. Um, does that help? Okay, John? Yeah, so um, I actually have meetings scheduled this week, I think, with our new LSAMP, um, LSAMP um, coordinator. Who happens to be a McNair alum? She's my math professor, so um, so she's very familiar with McNair. She actually does one of some of my McNair alumni um, sub, um, seminars in this. Usually in the spring, we bring in as many McNair alum from across the campus that are from all over the country, um, and they talk to our seniors about their experience in McNair and being a professor and whatnot. And so she's um, done that. And so we are going to have some joint seminars, joint workshops. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to be serving on their uh, committee for hiring their, their assistant director for the LSAMP program and things of that sort. So it's kind of a work in progress. We're basically kind of figuring out what things can we bring the organizations together to share resources on, like particularly like um, types of programming. And then having where the students can double dip, where they can be a McNair scholar, but also be an LSAMP and how does that work and what are we gonna provide individually so that we're not um, basically tearing the student apart by pulling them from different different limbs. Um, because um, I've got some scholars that are, we have a Sizer program on campus, which is for STEM education research and things. And they're in that program and we're all sorts of our students, you know, we're, we encourage them to get as experiences because each program can provide something different. So I think the key to it is when you have an LS AMP or other scholars programs on your campus is work with them to be clear about what McNair offers and what the other programs offer, which is what we do in my Explorers program. Because I tell them embedded in McNair is graduate school. Like we, there is an expectation that you apply to graduate school. That's not the case in some of our other programs where it's just basically doing research. And grad school is probably like, it's there, but it's not embedded into the program like it is with McNair. And some of them, like Michael said, are very hands-off, whereas McNair, we're all over these students. You know, we're meeting with them all the time. We're, we're, 
we're becoming a second family to them in some ways. And um, so, I mean, it's just coordinating with those other research programs on your campus because you're required to do that. Any other research program that works with underprivileged students, you're supposed to be working with them as well as other things. And so it's just, um, you know, helping with, you know, coordinating and make sure you're just providing reaching as many students as possible, but when students are in both programs, what are you actually providing to each other? And then keeping records of that. <laughs> we, we, we also, um, quickly, we also add, um, when, like students who don't get into our program for whatever reason, um, if they are STEM, we connect them directly with LSN, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so there's certain things like that we do. Um, also, I'm on the listserv for LSN. And so I get all anything that LSAMP is doing with their students, I get. And so I and, and they're open, like they don't, they might not advertise to everybody. So I end up sending it to our students who are also STEM, who also aren't in LSAMP. So for, for instance, women are um, 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 who are, are white women in our program who are not who are STEM, but not in LSAMP, for instance, I still send them that information and they still go to those events. They're open, like they support them to be able to go to those open events. And that's been very helpful too, especially with the writing of fellowships and things of that sort. Okay. Well, we are at time. I just wanted to throw up my contact information for anybody attending. If you want to reach out to me, please feel free to do so. Um, I have synchronized all of my social media. So it all is the exact same handle at Dr. Cami Valdez. Um, there's my website and uh, Gmail address. This picture was made by one of my McNair scholars at, at Tulani, and that is their uh, handle for uh, Instagram. So I like to give them a shout out, just like John did for his, uh, for his logo. And and I want to thank all of our panelists for being here with us today. I also need to do our disclaimer uh, that this is the opinion of all of us, the represent uh, all of the presenters and not of the NSF who's uh, funding this conference and LSMRCE. So um, huge, huge, huge round of applause to you all. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Um, it's always a joy to get to spend time with you all and hear about the awesome work that you're doing. Um, and I want to uh, tell all of our attendees that this um, the slides there's some other ones that um, were hidden or that we didn't get to they're going to be up on uh, the Whova uh, app i've got to have the iu people uh, upload it the it people upload it as well as some other resources for you um, there's also a link on the Whova app to the part one of this conversation so if you did not hear about that that kind of frames how the beginning stages of how to apply and all of the nitty-gritty on the application so if you didn't see that please do, do go back and don't forget that there is a survey. So in the Whova um, app, there is a survey for you um, to be able to um, to uh, give feedback about this session to uh, the organizers. So thanks so much. Cami, can I say one quick thing before Go everyone- Go for it, talk? Christabel. I, I just wanna let everyone know if you, are, if you are interested in knowing what an individual interview might look like for you, um, I did include up here at, if you look up to 925 in the time of the chat, um, there is a image, it is a background that I created, that I put on um, when I do the virtual interview, like Michael does with when we have the individual interviews um, and it has our questions, our interview questions that we ask our uh every applicant are you okay for me to add that to the resources please oh okay, absolutely we'll put that i will put that yeah. on you guys as well and then kelsey has put the survey for you all to fill out about the session so thank you bye everyone